Welcome to Hey All You Zombies. Uh, my name is Chris Abel. My colleague through the looking glass over there is Richard Krause. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and we welcome you again for joining us each week here on our podcast, which is all about crazy stuff uh, in movies, video games, technology, anything that's kind of cultural, but a little different and kind of cool. Last week, um, we spoke about turtles. We, t- we spoke about turtles. Things, you know, it, it can be anything. I hate to limit ourselves to technology and movies. And uh, yeah, last week we talked about turtles. This week we're talking about no turtles, but some you know things you don't normally hear about on podcasts. Well, you're going to talk about somebody who is often considered to be everybody's favorite uncle, although maybe not in the way that you might think, right? Yeah. Well, Uncle Ken Russell. Uh, <laughs> uh, uncle, you know, Ken Russell is uh, one of those directors, a film director, who I think has been ignored and unfairly ignored uh, for years now. You know, there was a time around uh, the time when he made movies like Women in Love, uh, like The Devils, like Savage Messiah, uh, where he was considered the boyfriend, where he was considered to be one of the most famous directors in the world. And in fact, there was uh, a poll done in Britain to try and uh, determine who the sort of most culturally significant people in Britain were, and Ken Russell beat the Beatles and a number of people uh, in you know in the very early 70s, late 60s and early 70s. He was a very significant figure, and he went on to make movies that became big hits like Tommy and uh, Altered States, uh, and then went on to make some movies that weren't big hits. And I, I think that the the kind of thing that I wanted to talk about today, about him in particular, was it's not only is it's his birthday, July 3rd, he would have been 85 today, he died last November, um, but I think that it's time that we start a resurgence of Ken Russell love back out here uh, on the internet tubes. Um, you know, you can find most of his movies, if you have a look, a lot of them are difficult to find uh, on DVD, although it's really worth the, the, the searching around if you can find them on DVD. Uh, but you know, you can also find them, have a look around YouTube, a lot of his short films are on YouTube, a lot of the films that he made for shows like Monitor and Omnibus, uh, they were music documentaries that he made for the BBC. They're available if you poke around the deep dark corners of the internet. Uh, if you can, always find uh, the release, the proper release of DVD or Blu-ray because they'll just be way better quality and you'll want to see them that way. These movies deserve to be seen and heard the way that Russell would have wanted you to, but they also deserve to be seen. So any way that you can find them, right. I suggest do it. But, you know, to talk about his significance, uh, the, the music documentaries that he made about uh, people like Mahler and, you know, all sorts of, you know, Richard Strauss, people like that, um, were made for uh, these Saturday and Sunday evening shows called Omnibus and, and uh, Monitor for the BBC. And it was interesting because before Ken Russell, the films were, you know, someone was born, they got a little older, they wrote some music, and then they died. And then here's why they're significant. And that's pretty much the form that these documentaries took. They were beautiful to look at. They were well acted. Russell, of course, brought in a, a different kind of view to these sort of things. So he would have different actors play the artist at different times in their life. He would include fantasy sequences. He would he really sort of shaped things up. Um, I, I think that the you know a lot of the techniques that he introduced in these have become... Uh, just sort of the way that documentaries are made now with reenactments and that kind of thing, for better or for worse, really. But his films are quite brilliant. But um, imagine uh, the Bob Dylan documentary, I'm Not There. Right. That's the film Ken Russell would have made about Bob Dylan had he made it. He would have had five different actors playing Dylan. He would have uh, made it, you know, confusing, possibly interesting, certainly, uh, and, and kind of a joy to watch. And the real joy of, of his love of the music came through in all these things. So, Ken Russell, July 3rd, his birthday. It's a sort of a holy day around here uh, because uh, <laughs> I've spent the last couple of years writing a, a book about a movie which you can find on DVD uh, oh, cool. if you go to the BFI website. It's called The Devils. This isn't the complete version uh, because Warner Brothers refuses to release a few key scenes that Russell shot 
1970. The movie was released in 1971. Uh, they were censored almost immediately in Britain, even more so by the time the film made it across the pond. And uh, the film met with brutal reviews. Uh, I think it is his masterpiece. Uh, so I spent two years writing a book about it. The book comes out in October. But I'll tell you, if you can find this movie, and, and you need an all-regions DVD player to, to watch this on it, um, it is kind of life-changing. It is so uh, visceral. And so uh, even 40 years after this movie was made, it still has the ability to shock. It has the ability to spin your head around. Uh, it's the story of uh, a group of nuns in, 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 based on a true story, based on the book by Aldous Huxley. Uh, a group of nuns in 1634 who were, uh, let's just say, possessed by the devil. All right. There's Sounds lots of good. theories as to why they were behaving the way that they were. Yeah. Uh, I won't go into all of them here because there's there's many many of them. But imagine like it, it's also been suggested that mass hysteria had something to do to it. Uh, do with it. It's also been suggested that maybe the wheat that they grew that year was left too long in the field and it got wet, and some sort of crazy psychedelic mold grew on it. And right. of course, the bread and everything that they were eating made them a little uh, crazy, and they started. Uh, imagining that devils were entering their body. Uh, but what ended up happening is that the church uh, ended up sending witch hunters uh, to uh, this parish in Loudon, France, uh, and the, the nuns started saying things like, well, it's Father Grandier, played by Oliver Reed in the movie, who comes to us at night in his devil form, and in, you know he, he has sex with us and does horrible things to us. And it turns out that uh, it is, Grandier is becoming the victim of a large-scale plot to get him out of there because the uh, Catholic, uh, uh, well, Cardinal Richelieu and the Catholic uh, King of France wanted all the walled cities torn down and for France to be one Catholic uh, uh, country. And I know that this, it's a very complicated movie. And the story, the, the story that I'm telling you, it's jumping all over the place. By the time the book comes out, I'll have a more concise version. Of it. <laughs> but it, 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 there's a lot going on here. But it's a beautifully told story, beautifully acted by Oliver Reed, by Vanessa Redgrave, by actors that you've never heard of but are really great, like Murray Melvin and Dudley Sutton. Gemma Jones is in here, and it, it's really worth having a look at. But it really sums up to me. Uh, the stuff that made Ken Russell great. He was never afraid to uh, sort of put some shock and awe in his movies. Uh, he right. was a deeply religious man. He was a deeply Catholic man. And, uh, but he, he wasn't afraid to question the church and sort of ask big, hard questions that he truly wanted to find the answers for. Um, and this movie uh, represents all of that and more. So The Devils, uh, you know, if you can find it, it's really worth having a look at. See if you can get it. If you're watching live right now, get it today so you can watch it on his birthday. And uh, I, I just remember he also made Tommy. He made you know a couple of dozen movies, yeah. and uh, he made Tommy as well. And when I was about 12 years old, I desperately needed to see Tommy, but it wasn't playing in the town that I played in. Uh, so I. Uh, hitchhiked. I snuck out early. I told uh, my parents that I had to go to school. There was an early, you know, soccer practice or something. I lied, and uh, hitchhiked to Halifax, which is 200 miles away. Watched the movie three times. I saved up my money. So wow. Went in once, <laughs> bought another ticket. Went in again, bought another ticket. Went in again, and then hitchhiked yeah. back uh, and got grounded for a year. But it was worth it. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Tommy's a great movie. I'm a unabashed Ken Russell fan, and I just want to say happy birthday, Uncle Ken, wherever you are. Yes, happy birthday, Uncle Ken. Um, so I guess one of the, the distinguishing features of a lot of his movies, though, is that they are visually um, very abstract, very yep. alive. In many ways, he kind of predated Terry Gilliam in terms of filling the screen with lots of details or predating, uh, you know, um, Ridley Scott, who, yep. who many people you know credit as introducing the idea of layering in terms right. of having all these layers in the backdrop. But the thing with Ken Russell, it wasn't just that he was an abstract artist of splashing lots of insane stuff on the screen. There was always a method to his madness. I think everything that I've seen of his, even though it's just really bizarre, dreamlike yep. at times, very surreal, where he's got you know chorus girls in Nazi uniforms doing yep. you know can cans on the wings of biplanes. Yep. Uh, there is something very coherent 
about it at the same time. He's not just doing it because he can. He's doing it because there's a direct impulse behind it. No, absolutely, absolutely. He was uh, a photographer for many years before uh, he actually got in front or behind, I guess, of a film camera, uh, like a moving film camera. So um, his photographs are beautiful. He took photographs, post-war photographs in London, and he did some fashion work, and he did a lot of sort of art photography. But the interesting thing about his uh, fashion photography is that he could not stand the idea of being in a studio and lighting the thing and having gossamer gowns, you know, high, high uh, couture gossamer gowns of people. So he used to, uh, London had, you know, had the hell bombed out of it during the war, and he used those as his backdrop. So even, you know, back in those days, he saw the beauty in things that other people wouldn't find particularly beautiful. And his pictures are complex, and they're interesting, and beyond all, they're beautiful. <laughs> Right. Very beautiful, and that uh, went forward into his film work. And so, yeah, his films are uh, visually really interesting because he had an eye, but there's detail in every scene. I went through, uh, for the Devil's Book, I spent about a month and a half going through the film almost frame by frame, as close to frame by frame as I could, looking at all the pictures and all the detail that's in this movie. And it's uh, absolutely gobsmackingly intricate. Everything that's there is there for a reason. Um, I love one of his uh, uh, theories about making period pieces. And many of the movies that he made were period films. And The Devils in particular, set in 1634, but it's set in this gleaming white tiled set and uh, they built the walled city of, of Loudon, or most of it anyway, Pinewood Studios in England. And, you know, people at the time were going, oh, man, why do you do it? Like, you know, uh, the, the, when we see historical uh, places, villages, and things on, in films, they're always sort of dowdy looking. There's broken bricks and stuff. And Russell said, you know what? Wherever you live, at whatever time you live in history, you think it's the most modern time ever. This is, right. this is, yeah. So you don't necessarily, you know, if you lived in 1634, you know, our idea of it is that it was wooden slats and they were sort of rotting and falling apart maybe or that a castle that had been there for 100 years it was falling apart. So people didn't live like that. He said they thought that where they were living was, was new and modern and sparkling. And in the Aldous Huxley book, there is a line uh, that uh, sort of describes... Uh, the, the, the stark white cleanliness of uh, the, the surroundings of one particular scene. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, uh, but it, it's described as like a rape in a public laboratory. And <laughs> Russell grabbed onto that idea and made this gleaming white set out of uh, like subway tiles, those white bathroom tiles. And it's absolutely stunning. Although one of the actors told me it was impossible to keep clean, and they spent as much time wiping down the set <laughs> as a... Uh, as they've been shooting on it. But, uh, but he, he was a visual man who thought about every frame in every movie that he ever made. And uh, the, the movies are really beautiful. Yeah, I think there have been a lot of filmmakers who try to be wild and crazy, uh, put all sorts yeah. of eclectic stuff. But I think the, the secret always to, to seeing his films is that you, if you start to think about it, you appreciate the incredible amount of time and effort that would go into just making those sets. Well, that it's something that had to have been planned right to the very inch. Yeah, Tommy is mind blowing. I mean, it's it's the most over art directed movie uh, outside of anything that Joel Schumacher, the, the Batman movies that Joel Schumacher made. And, but I'll tell you, it all works, and it, and it works, and it's memorable, and and it, it stays with you, and it clearly stayed with you know anyone who made a music video right. in the '80s, starting in the '80s, because uh, he kind of set the template, I think, for what music videos ended up looking like. Okay. Well, um, you know, we've just talked about a bunch of movies that you should seek out and find, uh, mm -hmm. but I want to talk about an interesting phenomenon, which are, uh, and I don't know if, if, if you're a part of this phenomenon, Richard, I'm hoping to find yeah. out, but uh, it's movies that don't exist, and so to really try to define this, I want to tell you that these are movies that to many people out there, they do exist. Right. There are movies that you can rent, movies that you can see. Right, but to specific individuals, they do not exist. Okay. And right. so uh, an example would be that I personally 
Um, as far as I'm aware, there's only one Highlander movie. <laughs> there are people who try to tell me that there are sequels that were made. But they don't know what they're talking about because they're right. actually, you know, as, as the theme of the whole movie is, there can be only one. There was only right. one Highlander movie. Now, there are even crazy people out there, just people I don't even understand, who say that there's a television series based on Highlander <laughs> and that they're only fans of the television series having never seen the movie. Those people I don't understand. Well, Those they're obviously people. nuts. Yes, they're on the fringe. I think they have something medically wrong with them. We need to look into their genetics. But that this is something I think that if you become a very passionate uh, movie fan or movie lover, then it's something that you start to experience. And that there are certain you know franchises or movies where people claim that there were sequels, but as right. far as you're concerned, there only was one. In fact, I remember that uh, you know when people would talk about these supposed Highlander sequels that were made, mm. uh, people would uh, you know ask how was it that kind of thing. That the, the often comment that you get was, well, there can be only one. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, and I've heard this before, uh, most recently from Adam Savage, who's one of the two hosts on the television series Mythbusters. Right. Uh, he has repeatedly said that, as far as he knows, there's only one Raiders of the Lost Ark movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an odd statement for him to make because he used to work at Industrial Light and Magic. Right. Uh, he actually has made um, a replica of Indiana Jones's hat, mm -hmm. and in doing so, actually uh, worked with a company that ended up becoming the company George Lucas hired for the Indiana Jones right. uh, fourth movie. And then he also uh, was in contact with the guy who made Indiana Jones' original whip. Oh, wow. And really, he actually bought some of the kangaroo leather that that guy had so that he could design his own Indiana Jones whip. So Adam Savage is a tremendous fan of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he runs into this problem in that he actually has to socialize with the people who work on the franchise. When he does, his trick is that uh, if anybody says, you know, let's talk about uh, Lost Kingdom of the Crystal Skull or right. anything like that, he instead refers to those movies as Raiders, Raiders of the Lost Ark 2, 3, right. or 4. Yeah, yeah. He will not say... He will not uh, sully his lips with the no. titles of those movies. Well, that's funny. I mean, I still, he's a purist. Right. Or... or Obstinate, maybe. I don't know. Is it, yeah. I know. I, I think it's interesting. I think it's an interesting idea. You just you, you simply refuse to acknowledge anything. I mean, you know, I love the Godfather movies. The oh, first right. one for me is the work of genius. I know people really like number two. The first one for me is the work of genius. You know, take the cannoli, leave the gun, take the cannoli, all that stuff. I love all that. I do. I refuse to acknowledge the presence on this planet of number three. I've seen it, I've seen it, but I will only ever call it number three. I wish I could call it number two, because it more accurately reflects my feelings about the movie. All right, yes. But number two is actually a pretty good movie. Yeah, and I think part of it is that it is a defense mechanism that we have to develop in a world now where everything is quickly commercialized. Anything right. that enters the mainstream as being original or new becomes assimilated, and you end up suddenly with companies that start to make Bambi 2, for right. example. And, you know, if it's especially if it's something that you are passionate about or that you love, then maybe it's something that you have to come up with in order to protect yourself from it. Bambi 2 wasn't actually a sequel, though. It's okay. what they call a mid call because the story actually happens around the middle of the Bambi story. All right. It's it's just Hollywood hocus pocus, but it's not a sequel. <laughs> it's a mid call. It's a mid call. It's a mid call. I What's know. interesting today? I I was talking about Barbarella. Uh, shot a, a segment for the Space Channel. We we're talking about Barbarella, and apparently they want to remake. Well, people have been trying to remake it for years, right? Dino right. De Laurentiis wanted to remake it a few years ago, and uh, Robert Rodriguez was going to direct it. Uh, now it looks like it might become a television series. I think all these are just horrible ideas. I, yeah. And the movie, when it came out, did not do well at all. Um, it became something later on. It became a camp classic later on. But I would suggest that more people are familiar with the posters and the imagery from the movie than they are from actually watching the movie. Right, yes. Uh, but what... They have, though, what Barbarella has developed over the years is a brand. So there's the brand Barbarella. So people who have never seen the movie go, oh, yeah, Barbarella, that's Jane Fonda with the crazy hair and the metal bra that sure, she wears yeah. and, you know, the orgasmatron. 
never seen the movie, but I know what it is. And so that is, I think, sort of what happens in Hollywood is you have people who go, well, you know what? People know what this Barbarella is. Let's, you know, let's capitalize on that. And it's more trying to capitalize on things than it is actually trying to make good things. Right. It's it's just, you know, this is something that people are going to go and see just because it sounds familiar to them. Yeah. And then I guess also it ties into a lot of the fashion. You've got the go-go boots. Uh, a yeah. lot of the 60s stuff is certainly in there. Well, and, and Jane Font and, and the, the original movie, I don't think there's a single scene in the movie that doesn't end with her getting her clothes torn off. So there's that part of it as well. You know? Right, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's it's an interesting thing. I find that um, I end up developing these feelings not just for movies, but for other things as well. Right. Out there. I mean, I know that after Douglas Adams passed away, right. somebody out there wrote a, a sequel to Hitchhiker's Guide right. to the Galaxy. I can't even fathom that somebody would sit down and try to attempt to do that. His voice was so singular. Well, see, what I heard about that was that there was like a computer program that had sort of plot points. They had broken down his books. And, you know, like literally by page seven, you have to introduce the robot. And by page, you know, and yeah. then they, they figured out the templates. Because there were a number of them, weren't there? It wasn't just one. Yeah, he wrote about um, four of them, and then uh, the fifth book was sort of the collection of what he had been working on, but right. hadn't had a chance to, to finish it. But I, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of people try to write in his style. There have been a lot of copycats that came out right. afterwards. And none of them seem to match it. I mean, just in right. terms of his intelligence and the ability to invoke so many ideas in just a few sentences. Yeah. Very, very brilliant. But I also, I also tend to feel this way about certain video games as well. I mean, there are people that try to tell me that there's more than three Splinter Cell video games. And, of course, I don't agree with that at all. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, and there may even be, if you were to do a search online, you could probably find a review written by me uh, about one of those games. But as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't exist. So I've right. got my little Sam Fisher statue here that yeah. I put as, a, as an homage to the games that uh, could have been. It's such uh, a sad thing that they stopped at three. Why didn't they keep going with that franchise? I don't know. It could have been but, great. Yeah, it could have been wonderful. I, I just, it's, it's, we'll, we'll never find out, I'm afraid. So, I mean, uh, um, obviously with this kind of topic, we'd like to encourage anybody out there who's mm -hmm. watching, come to HeyAllYouZombies.com and let us know of any other movies, books, albums, uh, video games, things that uh, simply do not exist out there for you. Do, are you just as twisted as we are? Well, I have, I have a couple. Oh, I have okay, a couple cool. that I've found. Like, well, and, and just, you, you mentioned music. Uh, uh, for me, uh, sound alikes don't exist. So you get uh, people that re-record songs. So the, the the lead singer leaves a band or a band breaks up, and you you have it has happened in the past where uh, albums have been re-recorded with a different singer. They don't exist. The original <laughs> is the only uh, is the only one. A lot of movies that you may not um, uh, that you may not care to acknowledge. Um, American Psycho two. For instance, right. Mila Kunis and William Shatner star no. in this movie. <laughs> Went straight to DVD. Uh, did you know that uh, there's a Home Alone 4 called Taking Back the House? Wow. Yeah. I didn't even know there was a 3. Yeah, and there was, you see, what was going to happen here is apparently... The, the fourth movie was going to lead into a television series if anybody rented or went to see it, which uh. they did not. Uh, <laughs> remember the movie Open Water? Yes, um, the, the shark movie. That, yeah, the shark movie. The two people sort of kind of direct. Really kind of cool little movie. Cost 25 cents to make, I think. And uh, two people in the middle of the ocean and, you know, sharks are surfing, basically. Uh, well, somehow they managed to come up with Open Water 2, Adrift, <laughs> uh, which uh, it's not really related to Open Water in any way. All apparently, right. I've never seen it. Um, but they decided to uh, repackage uh, this movie. They had a movie called The Drift, and they said, hey, let's throw the name Open Water on it. Uh, there's a movie called Road Trip, Beer Pong. Uh, Beer I mean, Pong. It goes on and on. Uh, Dr. Doolittle, Million Dollar Mutts. I mean, some of the originals of these aren't great, but uh, no. you have to wonder. Um, <laughs> I'll always know what you did last summer. Um, you know, there were a lot of those movies. So, anyway, these are these are just some other examples of movies that are, the world would be better off without Ace Ventura Jr. No, yeah. no, no. These are movies we'd be better off without. Well, and, and thankfully, I mean, most of those I haven't heard of. So, I guess I, you know, 
Well, I mean, you know, that that gives me some hope that people are sensible in some way. You know, I mean, yes. sequels frequently do very well. You know, and I, I, I'm also disheartened when I write a bad review for a, a sequel. I don't write bad reviews for all sequels, just not as a matter. It's not a blanket thing with me. But when it does happen that I write a bad review for a sequel, and then I get people that write me back like, "You don't know what you're talking about. This movie was okay." It was okay. just okay. <laughs> it was okay because I kind of knew the characters and I sort of knew what to expect. Yeah. And it didn't surprise me in any way. And it was really like just a really comfort food kind of movie. And that kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we also know we've talked about Ken Russell's birthday. Mm -hmm. Ken Russell uh, passed away last November. Uh, and he is joined now in that great film set of the sky by uh, Andy Griffith, who passed away today and apparently has been buried already. That's not the story. I just found this out before he uh, uh, went on air. He uh, apparently had it written in his will that he wanted to be buried immediately. immediately. And it's, it's happened. He was buried this morning. Uh, but I loved Andy Griffith. I grew up not watching the shows originally when they were on because I was too young, but uh, they were on constantly. Uh, you know, in years after that, there were hundreds of episodes, almost 300 episodes spread over three years. I have seen all of them, I'm sure. I can whistle the theme song. I even watched uh, the, uh, uh, the spin-offs, Gomer Pyle, USMC, and Mayberry RFD. I was a huge Don Knotts fan. But uh, Andrew Griffith, there was just something about the kind of warm charisma that he brought to everything that he did. And I wasn't as big a fan of Matlock, but you know, other people like Matlock. I wasn't as big a fan of it, but his work still had this kind of country boy charm to it that was his trademark. He started off as a monologist, and uh, he played this sort of, uh, I was going to say street smart, but that's not right. He was a country bumpkin that was very smart. That's the character that he played, but he had just a lot of common sense. Uh, but he would do these long monologues about a guy from the backwoods seeing a football game for the first time. And those kind of led to uh, then going on to Broadway, and he did a, a number of things. And then he made a movie called A Face in the Crowd. And I didn't see A Face in the Crowd until many, many, many years later. It was uh, 1957 it came out, uh, so three years before the Andy Griffith show went to air. And this was a movie where he played... The sort of what I guess was his trademark country bumpkin kind of character in the beginning. He's in jail. Uh, he's playing guitar, and uh, Patricia Neal, playing a television producer, sees him and says, "This guy's got something. This guy's special." Takes him out and gets him a television show, a local television show. It becomes a hit. They get, uh, they go statewide. That becomes a hit. He moves to New York. He's a giant star. He's the Roy Rogers. Uh, but the power goes to his head, and he decides that he's going to run for a political office, and he sort of stomps on the little people all of a sudden. And so oh. It's a whole reality tale. But okay. he was brilliant in it. Uh, and it really shows that he could do something more than just play Andy Griffith, you know. But it's a fantastic movie. Uh, also, I love his last movie, Waitress, uh, Adrian Shelley's movie. Uh, and it's just such a lovely little piece of work. It came out in 2007. And I interviewed him around the time of this movie. And uh, we talked about it. We talked about a number of things. It was lovely. I mean, he's one of those uh, people that when you listen to his voice, you're like, I can't believe I'm talking. I, mean, I can't believe that voice is talking to me. It's like uh, uh, Michael Caine. It's been like that with me interviewing right. Michael Caine. They have such distinctive voices. And it's a Woody Allen was another one that I was kind of like, I can't believe I'm talking to Woody Allen. But... Uh, but so I said, uh, you know, Ron Howard, uh, tell me a little bit about your relationship with Ron Howard. Uh, do you do you maintain one? Because of course they made uh, 279 episodes, I think it was, of the Andrew Griffith sure. show together, and Ron Howard sort of essentially grew up on that show. And I just loved. Uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Griffiths would have been probably 80 around this time, or 81. And he said, and Ron Howard would be in his 50s at least somewhere. And, uh, and Andy Griffith said to me, that Ronnie, he's such a nice little boy. And I'm like, how old do you have to be to see Ron Howard as a little boy? But I think it really spoke to the kind of father and son 
relationship that they had, the mentor relationship, you know. And uh, it was really sweet. I just loved that. He was that little Ronnie. Oh, he was such a nice little boy. He was such a nice little boy. So great. Well, it, it, he played a, a fatherly figure on, ca on camera, yeah. but not as you had so often in the 1950s and 60s, the archetypal father's no best, That's right. well, wholesome, clean-cut father. He was, although he was kind of warm and genial, yeah. um, he certainly, you know, wasn't trying to project a, a, an all-too-clean image. It was, it was very real to the, the sort of the, the landscape that he came from, right? Well, I think so. It was North Carolina. He's, he's you know, he... he he, he was from North Carolina, spent most of his life there. India Griffith was set in North Carolina, probably Matlock, too. It was his milieu. It was his thing, you know. And, uh, and there was just something about it that it, it was, he was kind of a common sense father. He didn't always do the right thing, but, you know, he always had advice. And he was, you know, sometimes he'd get mad. But it was kind of a, a, a warm kind of character. And they used to say, uh, one of his obituaries that I found today said, you know, he may have been America's sheriff, because, of course, he was sheriff, Andy uh, Taylor on the show, but he was everybody's paw, because he had, he always knew kind of the right thing to say. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, but I love that show. The show still holds up, you know, and, and it holds up uh, for any number of reasons. I mean, Ron Howard's terrific as the young, you know, the, the young Opie. Uh, all the other actors, the, the, you know, Floyd and everyone, they're all such characters, but it's the relationship for me between... Uh, Andy Taylor and uh, Barney Fife, played by Don Knotts. And Don Knotts, of course, went on. They worked together before the uh, the Taylor show, the, the Andy Griffith show, and they went on to work together again on Matlock. So they had kind of a lifelong association with one another. But uh, I think Barney Fife is one of the great comedic uh, uh, creations ever on television. He's fantastic in the show. Don Knotts is brilliant. And Andy Taylor, Andy Griffith, was kind of the, the sounding board for all that. So you can let Don Knotts be as bug-eyed and, you know, out of control sure, as yeah. he wanted to be because you always have the grounding of uh, Andy Griffith there. And uh, it wasn't to say that he wasn't funny on the show, but he was the, the rock that everything else happened around. And, you know, to have a, an actor like that, to have a career for 50 years, and uh, headline two very successful... Uh, prime time shows, one in two different kind of formats, one a half hour comedy, uh, one an hour long drama, um, that's a career, you know, and he made lots of good movies, and, and I think he was underrated as an actor, because he always sort of played in a certain parameter, but uh, he was gifted, and he was fun to watch, and that meant a lot to me. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, whenever we, we um, end up hearing about a, a, an actor like Andy Griffith passing away, um, the one thing I always sort of latch on to is the fact that they did live a full life. I mean, this is yeah. not someone who, you know, has ended their life early on, that they they had a their their chance to really explore their career all the way right to the end. Right. So that's a no, great thing. Absolutely. There's been no cause of death released uh, as we sit here talking. That may well happen. Um, he had heart trouble for years, uh, but now that he's been already interred, we may never know. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Turn on the TV. I'm sure somewhere uh, Andy of Mayberry is playing <laughs> the Andy Griffith show, and you know. Enjoy yeah, I, that. there's a um, um, there's a, a tip that goes around that if you ever get a song that's stuck in your head, right, some annoying little tune, that all you have you to do is, is whistle uh, the opening song to the Andy <laughs> Griffith song, and that will cure you right then right. and there. So there's mm -hmm. a, a tip to try. Uh, you know, one of the topics that I'm, I'm curious about, it's something I think anybody who plays video games a lot has thought about, um, is this idea that if you play video games a lot, you're in this virtual world, you will find that there's something about the dynamic of a video game structure that can motivate you to do in tasks that you would never do in real life. Such as? Such as really repetitive. So I'll give you an example, because um, I've done piles of these, and I'm sort of embarrassed to even talk about it. But in the original Rock Band game when that came out, there was an achievement for playing the endless set list. And that's where you had to play 58 songs in a row. That's real time, real life. Yeah. You're standing there. I know it's a video game, but even still, you have to kind of, you know, for about six hours in a row. Right, because the songs are games. probably like four minutes long each, right? Right, yes. And it's one of those things where you have to play every song 
perfectly. You have to get through it. You cannot fail any of those songs. So if you end, then you have to start the whole thing all over again. So to get through the six-hour block of it, it's pretty insane. And in my case, as you can imagine, it's hard to even convince somebody to come and do this with you because you have to play it as a band. So when I did it, I actually, to form a band, had to play the guitar and use a microphone at the same time. So I not only played the songs, but I sang them. And I know it's a video game, and you're not really playing the guitar, but it's still one of those insane things of why am I doing that. Right. Uh, there's another game called Crackdown in which um, there's an achievement if you go and you find these little orbs. Lots of games have sort of scavenger hunt style things. But in the, the scale of a video game, scavenger hunts become absolutely insane. Right. So in, in Crackdown, you have a reproduction of an actual city. And the orbs are scattered all over the city, not just you know, behind dumpsters or on, you know, front lawns or stuff like that, but vertically, because you have the ability to climb buildings. So, and climb in real time, where you have to press a button to go up one floor <laughs> by the next. And they, they've hidden these things, you know, behind spires, on balconies, all over the place. And there were 800 of these orbs all scattered throughout the city. And I'm, I'm sad to say I'm one of the sore losers that actually found all 800. You got all of them? And, and how long did it take? How long did that uh, take? It's something that you would do over the course of a couple hours every night for maybe, you know, several weeks in a row. Wow. I, I'm told that uh, by the game designers that of all the people who played the game, only 2% have actually mm -hmm. gotten all those because it's such a dire thing. But everybody who's played games, even those who are on Facebook now playing Farmville, have that experience of waking up and realizing – how on earth did I just devote three hours of my life to, you know, farming these little ingots or doing things of right. this nature? Uh, in fact, in doing research, I found that statement a lot in forums. Like, yeah, I'm amazed I got through the whole thing. I can't believe right. I did it. So the question becomes, what is it about the world of video games that motivates people to do this? And is there a way to apply that to real life? Uh, and there's a woman, uh, I'll pull up her name, or her photo here. There she is. Her name is Jane McGonigal. Right. She, there she is. She's a video game designer who has been spending the last 10 years exploring this very topic. Hmm. Uh, very intrigued about, because there are, if, if you uh, take up the, um, if you go to school to learn about video game design, they teach you that there is a psychology that's there, that the gambling right. institutions understand it as well, in terms of every action has to have a reward. You get up in the morning, yay, you brush your teeth, plus one, you know, all those ah. kinds of tropes that they do. And so what she was saying is, you know, can we apply those things to real life? Uh, and she's done lots of studies. She's talked to scientists who've, and asked them, okay, what kind of things what challenges are people trying to face in the course of their life in terms of emotional challenges, physical, trying to stay fit, keeping social connections, that sort of thing. Um, also, she did studies in terms of the kinds of things that people often regret at the end of their lives. And so this is something I thought that was very interesting that she uh, pulled up. Let's see if I got the list right here. That hospice workers um, did a report where, you know, having been in contact with people at the end of their lives over and over again, what kind of things are they always uh, regretting? Uh, the number one is that I wish I hadn't worked as so hard. Worked out so hard? I uh, worked so hard that I spent oh, too much so of my hard. life yeah. working really hard. And I was uh, going to say that I'm sure that it, there's nothing on that list that says, I wish I had worked more. Yeah, exactly. That's probably something they'd ever said. Uh, and wishing that you had been in touch with your friends more often. Yeah. Um, that you'd allow yourself to be happier, that oftentimes people feel at the end of their lives that they didn't permit themselves, right. that kind of thing, or that they had been more expressive of who they really are, or that they had lived uh, a life that would have been a little bit more truer to their dreams. Right. And so what Jane McGonigal has done that's interesting is that having taken all this, she's now created an app called Super Better that you can download on your iPhone for free that tries to apply the dynamics of a video game to just those kinds of things. Hmm. So that as you're playing it, it gives you quests. You right. know, today I'm going to reach out and be friendly to my friend Richard Krause, you know, wow. that kind of thing. And, and using it in the sense of trying to understand that these things are important because they allow you to have in a video game a power-up. Right. Uh, video games often do that. They, they, they make you very optimistic about life. They allow you to take on challenges that are bigger than yourself, and they do that with a system of things like power-ups, of identifying major goals as being epic wins, right. of having right. bad guys, and so she tries to help you identify things in your life that can be the bad guys, uh, developing a secret personality, identifying your friends as allies. It's a very intriguing concept. Hmm. 
That is. I mean, it, it, it's funny uh, to, to go way back to the beginning of that when you were saying, you know, how you would spend uh, two hours a night for weeks doing, you know, something that in real life you would never do. It just reminded me of uh, a comic that used to work in Toronto years ago, and he said, you know, they say uh, that you should, you know, drink eight glasses of water a day. He said, that's insane. No one's going to be able to drink eight glasses of water a day. Although, when I go out, I frequently drink like eight or nine beers, and I don't think anything of that, so... <laughs> Sometimes, you know, what's good for you versus what you want to do are two different things. Right? Yeah, and I guess it's sort of, you know, trying to tap into how it is that we can be motivated to do those kinds of things. Because right. in real life, if you had been asked to um, sit down, at, like there's one game where you end up building a, a dagger on an anvil, right. 50 of them just to go up a level. And if you would ask somebody to do that, at their job, yeah. they would balk at it. I'm not right. going to go and sit there and just do this repetitive task over and over again. Uh, there has to be some sort of reward for it. Do you, do you think that this uh, this app that, that sort of creates rewards for real life stuff, which is a, a, an intriguing idea, do you think that uh, it's sort of like the next generation, uh, the generation that's absolutely 100% grown up playing video games, do you think it will be more effective with them? Uh, you know, I would have thought that, but there has been sort of, you know, this movement in a very small way uh, with other activities. So, you know, a lot of the fitness apps that have come out today are right. slowly starting to incorporate that kind of dynamic where right. every time you complete a run, uh, you hear in your earphones a big, huge, you know, what they call um, a cheer. Or um, uh, Nike calls them attaboys. They actually had right. professional athletes record these little clips called attaboys. You know, like you could. Uh, who's the the cyclist that everybody? Lance uh, Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. So he did one. So at the end right. of your run or your cycle, <laughs> you can actually have Lance Armstrong in your ears go, "Yeah, way yeah. to go!" Wow. Uh, so there is that dynamic, and so I've seen it with people who have never played video games, sort of picking right. up on that. Uh, yeah. There are lots of what they call brain training games online which allows people to be able to uh, perform puzzles and reading tasks that are, are supposed to allow you to um, improve your mental acuity as you get older because right. you're no longer in school, you're no longer performing these kinds of academic tasks to get a way for you to do that. And they have the same sort of system where there are achievements to unlock and levels to go up in. Um, but I think a lot of it, if you really kind of want to express it visually, the best movie to do that with is Scott Pilgrim, because throughout the whole right. movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. he yeah. does that, where he goes up in a level, and every time right. he defeats somebody, a boyfriend, then he gets coins, and uh, even the, the moment of maturity, when Scott finally matures in his life, there's a, a plus one where he gains an extra life. You know, a yeah. lot of these yeah. concepts from video games. Uh, what's interesting for, for Jane McGonigal is that she said part of this came about because when she was young, she had a concussion. And it was a severe concussion. Uh, and it didn't heal properly. And immediately one of the issues that she had was that doctors told her there were a list of things that she couldn't have. She couldn't have caffeine. Uh, but they told her she couldn't play video games anymore. That <gasps> sitting in like front anymore of the ever. Well, just as long as she was trying to recover. And right. that drove her nuts because she was a video game huge fan, obviously yeah. getting into the business, being a designer. And the way that her friends sort of helped her... Um, grapple with that, because she was lying in bed, I wish I could play video games, was that they invented uh, a physical video game that would actually allow her to take on the tasks of her rehabilitation and right. then see it in terms of going up a level. And they, they called it, um, uh, con what was it, the Concussion Slayer? Is that <laughs> the, the little name of the game that they came up with. And I'm just going to scroll down, I'll pull it out. Uh, Jane the Concussion Slayer. That's uh, funny, wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Well, it's, it's, that's really fascinating to me. I mean, I do crosswords every day. Um, I spend a, an enormous amount of time online. But I still, you know, I, I do crosswords every day. But the idea of having Lance Armstrong go, yeah, when I'm done with it, that really appeals to me. I have yeah. to tell you. I did one thing. Well, I, I, I just finished one uh, uh, while I was waiting to shoot this Barbarella thing. And as I, I finished it all, I was kind of like, anybody, man. Nah. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that I no. knew uh, that yeg is another word for, you know, safe cracker. Nobody cares. No. But it well, keeps my brain working. And often the things that you tackle in life are moments in which you have to be the bigger person. You have to be the more mature okay. person. Oh, You're doing things for other people for which there is no fanfare. There is right. no reward. Um, so if there was a way in which you could kind of 
have those moments that you could celebrate them yourself or at least have that experience of someone saying, you know, I appreciate what you did. I appreciate the fact that you you, you you didn't have to do that. Anybody else would have just, you know, sold that person, throw them under the bus. Right. But no, no, no. You decide to stand up and be the more mature person. See, I thought that's what Facebook was for. That you go on Facebook and say, I am a better person than you. I thought that's what that was for. Well, I, no. I think <laughs> the, the difference being that one is sort of you're lording over other people, yeah. whereas, you know, you want to be on, just on the receiving end. Achievement unlocked. Yeah. Right. Right. Held the door open for a little old lady. She flipped me the bird as she walked by. <laughs> Made me, you know, feel really horrible about it. But you know what? It was the right thing to do. Achievement unlocked. There. You know, last week we did not play Movie Pistols at Dawn. No. We were no. having some technical difficulties. Uh, I have a feeling that I would have won. Probably. That's how I feel about it, but I'm just saying, yeah. I'm just throwing that out there in the world. <laughs> uh, but uh, we have an interesting, we're back, we're going to play Movie Pistols at Dawn this week, and I have a, a, a kind of interesting uh, lead-in to this one. In the new Spider-Man movie, starring Emma Stone and Andrew Garfield... I hear it's out there. I'm, I'm not sure it exists, though, to be honest. Uh, yes, I'm right. You, you've heard something about it. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, to me, there's this movie Sam Raimi did, but I get the feeling that's not what you're talking about. Okay. No, okay. it's not. It's not. Uh, it, this, is, uh, this is the new version. I'm sorry. It is out there. I've seen it. I know it exists. I'll forget. But don't worry. I'll forget about it soon enough. So. Okay. Uh, that's the kind of movie it is. But David Thompson, the great British film writer, uh, sort of... You know, in his very entertaining, he's always entertaining, but in his particularly entertaining Spider-Man review, uh, sort of news, you know, that if this movie was more like The Fly, in which, you know, a human was infused with fly DNA uh, in the same way that, you know, Peter Parker is bitten by the spider and sort of creates the spider, his spider... Tenses or his spidey <laughs> senses tingle when danger is around and he can stick to walls and things. Uh, but had it gone that way, like, had he become more spider than man, uh, that, you know, the love story would have been him crawling out of the sink and Gwen, played by Emma Stone, hitting him with a mop, killing him, because he would have been more spider than man. It's a very entertaining thing. But it got us thinking about uh, uh, interspecies relationships, right. and that is the topic at Movie Pistols at Dawn this week. Yeah, and, and so is, is that your choice, um, the new Spider-Man? No, 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 no. Okay, no. Uh, well, then... No, I think... Uh, you go ahead. All right, so um, uh, the choice that I settled on, and, you know, it's funny, because initially when I, I thought of this topic, I thought it would be very limited. I thought, okay, well, you know, you're, you're right, looking for examples of... No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, the moment that you start doing a search, you realize that every movie that features a vampire or a werewolf or even a, uh, a zombie with a romance story in it is going to have a technically right. an interspecies kiss. Um, right. So it's, it's quite out there. And every time somebody, you know, kisses a chimpanzee. But the one that I, I settled on mm -hmm. that I felt was the, the absolute best had to be from The Muppets Take Manhattan. Uh, when you have Kermit Ooh. the Frog and Miss Piggy uh, finally kissing for the first time after that long, prolonged would they, should they. Yeah. Uh, and I like it for a number of reasons. I mean, one is that I feel that it's, it's probably one of the first kisses that an entire generation had ever seen on the big screen. Um, it's right, also right. one that I felt that often in movies, we, when we have two people kissing, it's always the ideal pair. Even when you're dealing with, you know, vampires and, and werewolves, right. there are always beautiful people dressed up that are having this kind of a kiss. And so this is a wonderful moment in which you have two people who are very unlikely, right. who are not by society standards beautiful, although maybe Miss Piggy thinks that she is, but a frog yeah. and, you know, a pig, very unlikely match, and yet... Beautifully done, very sweet. I think everybody, the moment that it happens, is just a big, ah. But I also think it's just amazingly, very clever, the way that they shot the whole thing. Right. Because um, you never actually see the kiss. Yeah. It's one of those great moments where they do get married. They're at the, the, the altar. Kermit gives her a little peck right on the cheek. And then there's a moment where the two turn. And all you see is the back of her veil, and right. it moves up into the corner. Um, I also love the fact that uh, Kermit has denied the relationship ever since that happened. Uh, that uh, Jim, the way that Jim Henson pl played it, and I thought 
this is it. This is why Jim Henson is so fantastic, right. is that in every interview, because this becomes the problem, every time that Kermit the Frog sits down for an interview with uh, people, they always ask him, okay, well, you know, are you married to Miss yeah, Piggy? How's the relationship yeah. going? And his answer, as Kermit was always to say, that uh, to remind people that Muppets Take Manhattan was a movie, in which he was <laughs> an actor playing right. a role. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's fantastic. So there's always been that, that sense of... Um, sort of plausible deniability. Yeah. I think yes. that's what they call it. Yeah, that's that's funny. You know, I interviewed Kermit a little while ago, and uh, I, I had to be very mindful that Kermit exists in the world, and Kermit's experiences are different than the experiences that we see on film, because he's an actor in a film. Right. And, that's, that, and listen, you sit and talk to a frog <laughs> for an hour... And, and keep that in mind and make all the questions make sense as right. though you're talking to it really hard. It was really fun. It was really hard. <laughs> uh, it was in front of a, I hosted a press conference with him. When it was all said and done, I was like, whoa, because there were kids there. And I didn't want to blow oh, yeah. the, the illusion of Kermit for the kids. Yeah. You know? uh, my interspecies kiss, I think, you know, uh, I'm a huge David Cronenberg fan, and I had to go with uh, uh, The Fly. Okay. It's a great romance. It is It is uh, a, a speculative fiction story. It is science fiction. It is a little bit of, of uh, romance. It's a little bit of a lot of things that add up into one really interesting whole. And this is a movie that really holds up. 20 years old, you have great performances from Gina... Uh, Davis and Jeff Goldblum, um, and I just think that it's so, it's so kind of it's more than twenty years old. It's probably uh, twenty five years old. Man, this is an old movie. This is all I'm old. That's what that means. Nineteen eighty six. But you know, if you don't know the story, uh, he is a scientist who was working on uh, teleportion, no uh, teleportion, teleporting things, and uh, he experiments on himself. But little does he know that a fly gets into the other pod and it mingles with his DNA. And so he slowly turns into a fly. And it's not uh, a, an overnight process. It happens slowly. He develops super strength. His reflexes get really fast. Soon then he has to start eating in a very gross and awful way. But she's with him for most of this. She's hoping right. that there's a way to sort of turn it back. And So she is with him as he slowly turns from human into something else. And uh, um, I just think it's kind of uh, interesting that David Cronenberg could take uh, a slightly campy movie from the 1950s and then meld it and turn it into something that is uh, still, it's not campy, but it's, it's, it's fun, but it's serious. The love story actually really works really well. Now, it probably helps that Gina Davis and Jeff Goldblum were married at the time. Uh, so you have that chemistry happening anyway. But, you know, as he turns into a fly, um, it becomes this great tragedy. You know, this love story has been, has been thrown out the window because of, of uh, forces that they can't control anymore. So you could uh, be equi sort of the equivalent of perhaps someone getting very, very ill and becoming infirm, and it's, it's more difficult to look after them or be with them. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, different avenues to explore with this story. It's not just a silly science fiction movie about a guy that turns into a fly. And the romance works in this movie. And they do kiss. And they kiss after he starts to turn into a fly. That's the crazy part. So <laughs> I'm going to take the fly uh, with Dr. Seth Brundle, played by mm -hmm. Jeff Goldblum, and Gina Davis. Uh, you know, as one writer wrote here, uh, the pairing starts out hot and sexy, but quickly descends into insect dash repellent. <laughs> That's cute. It is, it is a really um, strong romance movie, and it's actually, I think, often cited by people as being one of the great romantic movies. Which you wouldn't wrote. think. You wouldn't no, think, not particularly after there's a dinner scene, that you would think no romance can happen after this, because he's got a, you know... Well, and I think what's key to it is that it somehow um, positions the, the couple... Uh, Gina Davis, both the two of them as being equals. Yeah. That you get this sense that it's not just that he's the mad scientist and she's the woman who has, for whatever reason, inexplicably fallen for him and now yeah. seems to be tied to her fate, but that the two of them really do share this 
intense interest in terms of his science and what he's accomplishing and yeah. the journey of, of going into the unknown and doing things, what the potential and the possibilities are, and how that can, for the two of them, sort of create uh, a life that they can share together. And then the real tragedy of all of that falling apart. That's not an easy thing to do when you have limbs falling off and right. toenails going down, you know, all, all that kind of thing. And also to have that coming from David Cronenberg, who yeah. many people often uh, would describe as being someone whose work is sort of antiseptic in a sense, right. very cold, almost distant, and yet here he's got this incredible, uh, you know, it's, it's different, say, compared to Beauty and the Beast. Right. And, you know, movies like that, which it's it's almost in that league. Beauty and the Beast can dress up Beast. Yeah, 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 yeah. All his hair beautiful and everything yeah. about it. And Bell. Seth Rundle's and, turning into a fly. Exactly. And it's not, he's not, you, you, no matter what, you can put a little, like, Victorian ruffle on him, he's still going to look like a fly. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, but, but the love story is great, and, and I, I think that's it. And that's what, uh, you mentioned a couple of things there. I think the Gina Davis, the strength of the Gina Davis character uh, was something that was certainly missing from the original film. And the original film has its pleasures, but the, yeah. you know, the female character was just often seen doing this. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know, there's a lot yeah. of that. He was just the female character, and it was more about, you know, the, the Vincent Price character. And, uh, and you know, uh, th those movies have their pleasures. I love a little uh, beat movie as much as anybody else. But The Fly takes it to a whole other level. And The Fly is a great example of remaking, reimagining, and redoing something in uh, an interesting way so that you maintain some of the spirit of the original, but you completely modernize it. And if you take away Gina Davis's crazy 80s hairstyle, that movie would play, it plays just as well today as it did in 1986. Oh, I completely agree. So there you go. We've got our two choices for this week in terms of movie pistols at dawn, interspecies kisses, uh, and what we would love to hear from you is what you find romantic on the screen that exists between two different species. And, and it's, believe me, we've only touched upon uh, just a little bit of what could be defined as an interspecies kiss. So by all means, go to our website, hailyouzombies.com, and let us know what you would have chosen if you were playing this game. And with that... There's loads to choose from. Think Splash... Think, you know, mermaid and men getting together, enemy mind, there's a crazy little bit in that. There's all sorts of movies you can choose here. So let's hear from you at heyallusobvious.com. And we thank you once again for joining us. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. We don't know yet what we're going to talk about, but it'll be different and unlike anything you've heard on other shows. <laughs>